Hello everyone. Welcome to the third lecture session of Unit Five. Uh, in this session, uh, so last uh, couple of sessions we saw the uh, concept uh, behind SPA. Why do we do SPA? What is the need? Then uh, we saw what is the SPA flow. That we uh, design data, we set up constraints, uh, we make sure that the design is uh, properly constrained, and then uh, we saw. Uh, uh, we saw last session we studied about the interconnect. So interconnect is a is a very integral part of doing SDA. Uh, that is post layout SDA is not complete without accurate interconnect data. Now in this uh, session we will look up uh, look it look more deeply into the clock and timing exception. So uh, the agenda is we will look at uh, we will have an overview of the clock what are uh, characteristics. Are associated with clock. We will see uh, how the clock is specified. We look at uh, uh, a couple of important uh, terminologies associated with clocks: clock latency and clock scale. We will see what are generated clocks, uh, and then we look uh, more deeply into timing exception. Now, most of what we uh, learn about in this section uh, should ideally be applied to synthesis level example. I mean, uh, between synthesis and SDA. Uh, there is not much of a difference when when it comes to this what we discuss in this session. But uh, uh, synthesis constraints are comparatively a bit more simpler uh, when compared to static timing analysis. This is because STA is aimed at uh, making sure that design works in all the operating corners, and we want to make sure very very carefully that no uh, no path is missed. We need to make sure that all paths are covered, all paths are properly constrained, and so on. Synthesis again is, uh, let's say, uh, let's say you have a couple of clocks in your design. They go through a mux, uh, so you have an option of selecting which clock to choose for synthesis, right? Uh, let's say you have you have 100 megahertz clock and 50 megahertz clock, and there's a mux, and you choose which which clock would you uh, choose for uh, your design. You can have a choice based on selection. Now, when you synthesize, it's uh, clear that you would choose a higher frequency clock because we are con concerned about the uh, performance. But for STA, you need to make sure that the design works for both the clocks. Somebody might uh, question that okay, the design works at 100 megahertz. It is supposed to work at 50 megahertz. Yes, it is. It will work at 50 megahertz. There will not be any setup problem. But what about hold? There might so you need to also sensitize the path of the 50 megahertz clock to make sure that the design works at that. So in this specification, you have said that your design will work on both the clock. So this is what changes between synthesis and SPA. Synthesis major concern: the design should get the highest frequency possible. Uh, you are not concerned about the uh, the DFT part as well. In SDA, you are concerned about DFT. You are concerned about all other test modes, uh, like like the chips we work on have number of test test modes. Uh, some test modes are dedicated for some interfaces and so on. So we need to make sure that the chip works in all such modes apart from functional. So that's where SDA becomes a bit more complex in terms of uh, constraint points, right? So that's why we the, the the commands similar commands in time time. Will be much more powerful. Will have much more options than compared to design compiler. This is why uh, we, uh, though there are overlaps between SPA and synthesis, but we will revisit all such commands and all such constraints when it comes to SPA, and we'll dig deep into it. Right? So, so clocks. We've already seen uh, how to define a basic clock in design compiler. Uh, the last we did all had single clock. But there can be multiple clocks, and uh, a design definitely can have multiple clocks. In fact, the chips we work on have some uh, close to about 20, 25 function clocks. Right? Uh, for example, if you take a take a chip for a mobile phone, it will have maybe 50 odd clocks for uh, for lots, so many applications that a chip does. Uh, so definitely, uh, we can define multiple clocks that have different waveforms and frequencies. Uh, the, there are two clocks, two type of clock. One is the uh, virtual clock, other is the real clock. A virtual clock does not have a port associated with it. And then a clock has uh, two uh, 
characteristics one is the delay network delay uh, latency and skew we will see more of this uh, in the upcoming slides the clock a clock can be either gated or generated uh, a gated clock is one we saw an example of clock gating where uh, power compiler will add the clock weights to the design or in fact you can have in the RTM itself you can have some kind of rating involved. So a design can have gated clock uh, which is controlled by some enable signal. Uh, it is very essential to make sure that both setup and hold constraints are verified on this gated clock. Now a gating element uh, in all probability would be a latch would be latch plus some combination element. So we have to make sure that setup and hold constraints are met at this latch. So prime time enables us to do that. Uh, in addition, uh, a design can have generated clocks. Generated clocks are uh, many times a design will have a flop based divider or uh, a some some counter based divider, some gate, gate uh, gating logic based dividers. There are a lot of clock dividers. Uh, you can even search the net for those. There are a lot of clock dividers available. In digital domain, so a, a design can use those clock dividers to generate uh, multiple frequencies. Uh, so prime time enables us to define those clocks. Uh, then again, the, uh, it comes to uh, uh, there's one more characteristic called transition time. So we can we we saw this example. We saw how to specify a set clock transition in design compiler. It is not different in prime time. It's exactly same. The only thing you need to uh, now. See, since see now we are talking about X two A, so we should also clearly de uh, mark out the differences between pre layout and post layout. In pre layout, you would define set clock function yes, because you don't have actual transition number, and uh, since you don't want the analysis to be optimistic, we'll define some clock function number. Right? We defined about 300 ps in one of our labs, but post layout uh, we don't need to define clock function. Why? Because prime time has all the parasitic data, and we uh, discussed in the last session that at every node, whether it be a data path or a clock path, prime time will calculate transition. So, post layout, the transition numbers are accurate, pre layout, the transition numbers are estimates. So, post layout, you don't need to define clock transition. Uh, let's look at uh, the clock specification. Uh, this, uh, we need to tell prime time. At what port we are creating the clock? What is the frequency of the clock in terms of period? Then we need to tell prime time what is the duty cycle time. Uh, we may choose to tell the duty cycle, or we may choose choose to tell the. There is an option called edges uh, and waveforms. So there are multiple ways in which you can define the clock. We will see some examples. So this is the basic clock specification. Now uh, the figure on the right hand side uh, is something called sys clock. So now uh, we need a a clock of this type which rises at 0, falls at 5 and the period is 20. So we map this to the command create clock minus name sys clock. Now this is the port, this is the this is the clock name which can be anything and this is the port of the design. Period is 20 as given from the diagram and waveform is 0, 5. Waveform the first digit means rise, the time at which the clock rises, the second one means the time at which it falls. Now, let us say in this case, uh, what if I do not give the uh, waveform? If I omit this, what the PT will do, it will create a clock of period 20 and it will create a clock of default 50 percent duty cycle. That means it will rise at 0 and fall at 10, it will do something like this. So, if you choose to omit waveform, then please make sure that uh, please be reminded of that it will create a 50 percent duty cycle clock by default. Now, we will see some advanced uh, some some other uh, options of create clock. So, now uh, let us say you have uh, this is a JTAG clock. So, many times the test clocks are slower, but they are not a 50 percent duty cycle, they can have. Waveforms such as these, where so now in this case, uh, this this is a comparatively complex clock with period being 1.2. This is the period, and in this period, it rises and falls twice, right? But it repeats periodically after 1.2. So uh, this is uh, test clocks can be like this. Uh, so this is not not a surprise. 
but although uh, the functional clocks are not like this because you would typically want one active edge per clock period, but uh, the test clocks can have this kind of feature. So how do we define such a complex clock? First thing you tell what is the period. Second thing, the waveform. Uh, waveform now you define the waveform. Rise at 0 0.3, fall at 0 0.4, again rise at 0.8, fall at 1, and it repeats in a period of 1.2. This is the way you define the complete specification by using the waveform switch. Uh, so you can explore, uh, you can see the man page of the clock. There are a lot many options uh, you can try out. In fact, uh, there is one more command create generated clock which we will see later. It has more options than create clock, but these are the two uh, most famous applications of create clock. Uh, first, you give the period, most important, then you define the waveform. And then you tell what port the clock actually creates. Now, let, let's look at a characteristic called clock latency. Now, uh, clock latency is uh, so when uh, you define a clock on a clock port, that, that clock will fan out to a number of thousands of resistors, right? So, pre layout uh, prime time does not have any information of the clock network. So, what it does pre layout. It considers the clock to be ideal by default. Ideal means that the clock will reach all the clocks at the same time, and if you don't give anything, it will reach at in zero time. So there will be no delay. So the, the only delay will be if any of the uh, if any of the uh, for any of the buffers included in the clock. Not that's all. There won't be otherwise there won't be any delay. That too in ideal clock mode, prime time does not consider any clock at all delay. Whether there be buffers or valid model, whatever. Prime time will assume every clock gets the clock in zero time, right? To uh, make sure, if you want to implement, if you want to estimate and apply any clock latency, there are two types, there are two ways, right? First is for post layout. This is for post layout. We can either allow prime time to compute latency by propagating the delays along the clock network. This is accurate, but it is only applicable if you have accurate parasitics and when you have accurate parasitics only after the design has been placed about it, right. So, we will we'll see this, uh, we will see this example of this in the lab also. Second way is the estimation which is for the pre layout part. So, we can estimate and specify explicitly the latency of each clock. We can specify this latency on individual ports. Any register clock pin in the transistor pan out, transistor pan out means uh, all such registers which on which this particular clock reaches are affected and, and override any value set, set on the clock update. This is typically used before clock resynthesis. We will see an example of this. So, this is an ideal clock, for example. So, this is a, a clock source. Uh, this is the clock source, this is PLS. Now, let us say this is the chip I am working on, right? This is and I am doing HTA for this chip, this boundary here. So, there will be a PLS. I define the clock as the output of the PLS, which is typically the case. Uh, but let us now consider this design. Let us say you are doing the, the STA of now this boundary, which does not include the PLS. So, what we do is uh, we will define the clock at the port. Let's assume this is the port. We define the clock at this port. Now, a latency has two. Uh, there are two types of latencies. First is the network latency. That means uh, the network delay, the delay, the time it takes from the clock definition point to reach to all the clocks in the design. This is called network latency. For an ideal clock, if you don't give anything, the network latency is assumed to be zero. The source latency is the one. Is a delay between the clock definition point, which is the port of your design, and the real clock source, if you know about it, the real clock source from which the clock will come. So, in this case, we know that the clock will come from a PLL, it will reach this uh, clock definition point in some amount of time. This is called source latency. Now, uh, for STA purpose, uh, now let us say. Uh, so this was for the on chip clock source. Let's say you have a, you have an off chip clock clock source. Uh, this is very common for many interfaces like let's say I2C or 
or SP or there are lot of lot of chip level interfaces on which the clock will come where comes from either a different chip or from a different or from a clock source which is situated off chip. So in this case also things remain same. The clock source, the the, the time it takes from clock source to the clock destination point is called source latency. Network latency is what is inside the design. So you can remember it this way. Network latency is the latency which is within the scope of a design. Source latency is something which is outside of a design. Right? Now this is these are the commands which you use to define the source latency and network latency by giving minus source and minus network. Uh, if you don't give anything by default, it is uh, supposed to be a network latency. Now, uh, what is important? What is not? Now many times uh, we do not give any source latency. Many times, why? Because uh, first of all, we are uh, let's say I am working on this the design at the at the bottom. Now many times I will not be worried about the source latency uh, because the source latency by default, I mean in most of the cases, it will not affect the timing analysis of the design. Uh, we'll we'll understand it why when we when we progress through this uh, unit. But uh, but network latency now, what network latency represents is, see, see network latency is an estimated value, it is not an accurate value, right? When you talk about any set clock latency, also please note that set clock latency is for the network part is only used for pre layout, for post layout, prime time actually calculates all the numbers because it has all the data. So, when we apply the estimate of network latency. Uh, Usually, in when I do SPA, I in most of the cases I do not use the source latency or network latency. Source latency, why I do not use source latency is because many times I do not have any estimate. And let's say a source latency, a uniform source latency of X will not affect the results of my X. Coming to network latency, now network latency becomes important in the case where lot of all the flaws in your design will not get the Clock at the same time, they will get clock at a different point of time. This mimics the clock tree synthesis data. So, what clock tree tries to achieve in, in, in back end, it will try to make sure that the delay, the absolute delay, I mean, so let us say there are 1000 clocks on which the clock will go. It will make a buffer tree, it will make a clock tree, and the aim is to make sure that the clock reaches at all the registers in a very tight window. So the absolute difference between the latest arrival and the earliest arrival is not huge. Let's say for uh, let's say I could say that I could tell my backend guy that please try and make sure that the clock. So this is called clock skew. The maximum difference between the two registers, I mean the difference between the maximum arrival and the minimum arrival, is called the clock skew. So the the aim of the clock tree synthesis is to keep this skew to a minimum. Now. Uh, you can you can use network latency to implement that. How you can say that set clock latency. So in this case, there's a so, uh, in this case you can use a you can use it without source or with source. The effect is same. So uh, the other thing that mimics this process, this queue, is called clock uncertainty. We'll see about that in the next slide. So but please be careful while using the source and network latency. You should know what affects your SP and what what does not affect. If you give something like this, like right, clock latency minus source, get clock six clock, and you have only one clock in your design, then it does not make any difference to your timing analysis. However, if you do something like this, minus early and minus late, this will make a difference because now the values are different. Now let's see what prime time does. So if you give minus early and minus late options. So what what prime time will do is that from the idle clock without so the the, the top waveform is the idle clock without any clock latency. So uh, the waveform is zero and five. Now it will apply the early value plus one point five. So it will delay the edges by one point five each. This one, this one, and this one, and then it will create one more clock in time, which is which is delayed by the late value. And now for setup analysis, what it will do? It will launch late and capture early. Launch late and capture early. What it means is that it will take the case which is most pessimistic, which is most restrictive. 
so it will assume that for setup the launch clock will come as late as possible and the capture clock will come as early as possible now see the the difference between early and late is 1 nanosecond and uh, so it is 1 ns here and 1 ns here so it will shrink your clock period by 2 ns because you are uh, delaying the uh, the one edge by 2.5 and uh, you are you are uh, launching late and capturing early for hold it will do the other way around whatever is most restrictive for hold it will launch early and capture late so this is this is the hold it is a hold is a zero cycle thing so it will launch early and capture late right. So uh, please be careful in using this uh, early and late figures you should be very sure that what is the application you are trying to uh, what is the uh, what is the specification you are trying to implement? Now, uh, second is the case where uh, you have actual parasitic data. In this case, uh, you probably, in most of the cases, will not need a set clock latency command unless and until you want to implement something that is off chip and that has an early and late value. So, still, see, still, when when uh, when uh, you have actual parasitic, still, this is the part which you cannot. Get implement accurately because this is something which is off chip. So uh, you need to still again uh, based on you need to write commands based on some specifications which are already available to you or some estimates, right? And only when you have a different early and late value. So uh, when you have actual parasitics with you, uh, prime time can accurately determine clock latency by propagating the clock through the network. This is highly accurate uh, uh, analysis, and uh, the command to do this is that propagate a clock. So you define the clock, you say create clock, uh, you say create clock CLK minus period minus waveform, and then say that says set propagated clock. Only when you give set propagated clock, prime time will start the actual analysis. Without this, without setting propagated clock, it will treat your clock as ideal. So. This is now something special and different from synthesis. So, if we have written parasitic data, if we have defined your clocks and not given set propagated clock, your analysis is waste. So, this is one extra command that you need to add to your constraint files when you go from synthesis to SP. This is one of the most important commands. Please remember. Clock uncertainty is a uh, Something that uh, is a command that helps us in mimicking the clock skew that comes as comes as a result of the clock free synthesis. Now, uh, what what clock uncertainty does? Let's say we apply the uncertainty minus setup. There are two options: minus setup, minus hold. You can if you don't apply this option, the same uncertainty value is taken for both setup and hold. So we defined like clock uncertainty. Let's say in this case we defined a 0.2 value for setup and 0.05 value for hold on a particular clock. What this will do is that uh, it will, for setup check, check, it will subtract 0.2 from the capture. So it is again taking which whichever is in most present state. So uncertainty means that the capture edge can come either late by this value or earlier by this value for setup it will consider the capture edge to be coming earlier because it is more restrictive analysis it will reduce your slack. So now for setup it will capture here instead of here so earlier for setup without any uncertainty it would have captured here now it is capturing here right for hold earlier it would be it would have been capturing here uh, in fact not not this edge hold would be the same edge. So it would be capturing here, or now we can take here because these are both the edges are same. Uh, now it will capture later, which is more restrictive for hold. So clock uncertainty, the value will decrease this amount of slack you have. Now, uh, so uh, when you apply uncertainty from between two different clock domains, it is called interclock uncertainty. The command is same. The only difference now here is that earlier you gave just if you give just single clock without any minus from into option, this uncertainty is called intra clock, clock uncertainty. If you say minus from to some clock, then it becomes a uh, inter clock uncertainty, right? 
Now, important points. Pre layout has ideal clock. What it means is that ST assumes clock arrives at each clock at the same time. In this case, we have to apply, we should apply some clock uncertainty. What values do we apply? We up, the clock uncertainty for pre layout should be clock 3 skew plus PL editor. Clock 3 skew you will get from your backend, from the person who is doing backend. It is a it is a function, uh, clock 3 skew is a value which you give to the backend tool and it will try to meet the clock skew within this range. So you should uh, you should ask this uh, or you should search, uh, if you do not do backend yourself you should ask the backend engineer for this value and he will provide. If not you have to estimate it, you can set it to either 200 PS or 300 PS depending on the uh, clock specification. PLL jitter is uh, the case where the clock comes from PLL and it is the spec of the PLL. right? For example, a PLL might have a 25 PS receiver. This is very important. So, please do not, uh, whenever you do synthesis or you do PLA out STA, do not forget to apply clock uncertainty because otherwise you are not capturing the effect of the clock skew, which will come into place after the backend has been done. For post layout, now post layout, you know this, uh, you do not need to give this. Why? Because the clock tree is accurately captured and time time will calculate all the delay. So, but PLL jitter is still available, is still there, PLL jitter has not disappeared or has not been calculated, PLL jitter is a function of a PLL, it comes from the dot lib of the PLL and uh, you should always apply this. So, for example, pre layout let, let me give, give you some values for uh, more clarity, pre layout uh, I can say that my clock tree skew would be 300 PS and let us say my PLL jitter is 25 PS. So, my pre layout clock uncertainty would be 300 plus 25, 325 PS. When I go to post layout now, I know that my clock tree skew is taken care of when I set propagated clock, but PLL jitter is still is present. So, I will set my clock uncertainty to be sim simply the jitter value which is 25 PS. Right? Okay. Clock uncertainty has one more uh, application, it is very popular. So let us say you are doing synthesis now and uh, you are your target frequency let us say is 400, 400 megahertz, but uh, you have a doubt in your mind that okay whatever uh, values I am applying the uncertainty values or now I applied some, some I applied the clock frequency now, but you want to over synthesize the design for some reason right for some reason you want to uh, experiment that okay I am not sure that okay the design I am synthesizing at 200. But in backend, due to some uh, mismatch between the backend and my synthesis, or uh, due to my wire load model not being accurate enough, uh, I need to have some margin in synthesis. So, what you could do, there are two choices. One, you can increase the clock frequency for synthesis, you can let's say synthesize at 450 megahertz, or you can apply an extra clock uncertainty. So, uh, extra, so any number you apply in clock uncertainty will reduce that value from the clock period for setup check right and in design compiler in synthesis we are worried about the setup because it affects our performance. So, we can we can use set clock uncertainty to give us some margin in synthesis right this is a, a very popular application of clock uncertainty. But this the, the slide here gives you a very good idea of what values to give in field layout and post layout. Okay, now now let us come to generated clocks, generated clocks uh, are based on master clock can have uh, a generated clock can be generated from either a master clock a primary clock uh, what we call or even a one more generated clock. So, you can have a generated of a generated clock, it does not require any additional constraints it means uh, it means that uh, it does not need to be we do not need to apply any uh, clock latency and uh, uncertainty because everything will be derived from the master clock itself. Start point of the clock path is the master clock definition point. So, this thing will, will become clear once we do the lab, uh, these, these two statements. So, uh, in what cases do we give generated clock? One, is, one of the example is a divider, clock divider. Now, this, uh, this logic is nothing but a clock divider. Uh, the Q n is fed back into D or if Q n pin is not available, inverted Q will be fed back into D. So, at every edge of at every active edge of CLKP, CLK, uh, CLKP div by 2 will be a divided by 2 clock of CLKP, right. So, CLKP is a master clock like this, like this, 
and every active edge that means uh, so this pause edge will generate this this edge this pause edge will generate this negative edge because it's inversion happening and fed back into d so this is the clk p divided by 2 is a divide by 2 clock how do we define so if you do not do anything what uh, prime time will do is that it will trace you define the master clock here and prime time will simply stop here it will not do anything so all these clock points will be without clock if you do not define a generated clock because prime time by default will not go through a sequential element it goes through a combination element but not through a sequential element by default that's a default behavior so you need to give a generated clock name this can be any string source is the master clock source which is this point wherever master clock is defined and we say divide by 2 and where to create it in create clock the where part is either a pin or a port again in create generated clock the where part is the um, either a pin mostly it's a pin and uh, so you you tell that you tell prime time that i have a generated clock which is with, with this name which is generated from this source created at this point and the relationship is divided by 2 now this this string here divide by 2 should match your netlist functionality also this is very essential the the matching of the command the create generated clock command and your netlist structure the functionality of a netlist is very important if there is a mismatch then prime time will not be able to calculate this delay now see now uh, see this let's say this you define some latency for this clock now what is the latency of a divide by 2 clock the latency of divide by 2 clock is the latency of the master clock plus the latency of the path the delay of the path from the master clock to the generated clock right if there is a mismatch in the in the in, in this string divide by 2 for example and the functionality let's say you don't you get divide by 2 but the register there's no register here there is some buffer here in that case there is a mismatch and prime time will not calculate the correct clock delay right so it will also give a warning we'll see what warning is that so you should look look out for these kind of warnings and make sure that your uh, you don't have any such warnings which tells you that there's a mismatch in that list and the clock definition now generated clock there can be lot many examples of generated clock we'll see few of those there can be a multiplied clock so there there can be some logic which multiplies the clock so instead of using a divide by you can use a multiply by rest all options remain same you can have a gated clock in the sense that uh, so in this example the sys clock is gated with sc control and a core clock is generated now in this case uh, there are two states whether this clock core clock is off or on right in sta you are concerned about the state on you are not concerned about the off state right you are assuming that core clock is present always so you don't need to worry about the sc control logic you just need to specify a clock here at core clock and say that this clock is just a divide by one that means the waveform here at this clock and the waveform at core clock are both same so divide by, by one tells that so you can even have a divide by uh, many times we have a case like this we have a clock defined on the input port and we create a generated clock at this point uh, which is the output of a buffer so it is a very useful application uh, when you do more SPA uh, when you become a bit more experienced in SPA you will probably appreciate uh, the divide by one functionality so uh, it's a very popular application using a divide by one clock uh, so this is how you create it let's give divide by one and so divide by one should not have, have any flop involved why uh, because whenever there is a flop involved usually the division is more than one the division factor is more than one it's either two or or four or something like that so whenever it's divided by one, it means that it's going through a combination logic which does not uh, include any any period division. Okay, okay let's. Uh, now this is one case where uh, we do not use a generated clock, but uh, this is why because uh, there are two clocks that are generated generating a generated clock. What it means is that. There is a clock, sys clock here. There is a core clock here, and ending of these two is generating a main clock. 
So sys clock, core clock. When we add, we get this kind of a waveform. Now we could uh, we could create a generated clock here, but uh, it won't be it won't be it is not recommended because it is generating of two clocks, sys clock and core clock. So in this case, we just do a create clock. Uh, but the only problem is that when you do a create clock here, all the latencies behind this, that is, these all these latencies. Are not taken into account. Any create clock means whenever you tell prime time it's a create clock at some point, all the latencies before that point are discarded. Only the latencies which are proceeding from that point are calculated. When you do a create generated clock, all the latencies leading back to the create clock will be taken into account. So you have to be very careful in such cases. This also depends on what is the relationship between main core and sys clock. Are they synchronous? Are they asynchronous? If they are, what is the what is the nature of the timing pass between them? So this is a one particular example, but it does not mean that you use this create clock every time you see this kind of an object. It completely depends on the type of a design. Right? There's one more uh, option. Uh, so uh, these examples we saw that uh, we saw the use of uh, Divide by and multiply by options. The more popular is the edges option. Edges option clearly tells prime time what are the edges being used to generate uh, generated clock. I would recommend using the edges uh, whenever you can. I prefer edges over divide by. I'll tell you why. Uh, let's let's see this these cases. Now let's say you have a uh, you have a clock master clock DCLK here. Now there are three clocks here: PH zero clock, DCLK div two, PH one clock. Now at Q we know it's a divide by two clock, but now DCLK is inverted here. What it means is that instead of positive edge generating the clock, now it's the negative edge that is generating the clock. So let's see the waveforms. So this is this this is the negative edge. This is the negative edge. This is the negative edge, and generated clock, generated divided by two clock, is now generating of the negative edge. So this negative edge will cause this cause edge. This negative edge cause will edge will cause this negative. So DCLK divided by two is generated of the negative edge of DCLK. Now in this case, if you were to give a give a divide by one, prime time will give an error because prime time finds that divide by one, sorry, divide by two to give prime time will assume always assume that. It is the positive edge that is generating. So in this case, you have to give, you have to tell prime time in some way that negative edge is generating this clock. How do you tell that? You forget divide by two option. You use the edges command. The edges of the master clock are numbered like this: one, two, three, four. And you tell prime time that DCL to div two, the rise edge comes at two, the fall edge comes at four, the next rise edge, rise edge comes at six. You have to give at least three edges because this will define the complete period. Rise, fall, and rise combined together. These three edges define a complete period of the generated clock. So this is what you do: created create generated clock minus name edges two, four, six. One, three, and five are positive edges. Two, four, six are negative. So now prime time knows that negative is being used to generate the generated clock. Similarly, P F P F zero clock. Is an uh, and of the master clock uh, and the uh, divide by two clock. So this is the ending logic. Uh, so it will generate this kind of a clock. Now, now looking at this waveform. Uh, now looking at this waveform, P S zero clock, you can easily define the clock. What are the edges? Three, four, and seven. Right. For P S one clock, what are the edges? One, two, and five. So now our job becomes very easy. You know your design. You can draw the clock waveforms. What is needed? You know what clock waveforms will be there, and then just translate that clock waveform into edge and define a generated clock. This is the most, is the best way to define generated clock. This will leave out any ambiguity about which edge is generating, uh, which edge of master clock is generating the generated clock. Right. Uh, again, this is the case of the clock, the inverted clock. So in this case, the clock is inverted. So in this case also, I would recommend using edges option. There is one more case, which is uh, one more way you could do that. You can say divide by two and add minus inversion. 
so this tells that instead of uh, okay uh, so non inverted version would would look something like this but there's a inverter here so you can tell that you are now you are defining the clock after the inverter not before the inverter before the inverter the situation will remain same but when you are defining after the inverter you can say minus invert and prime time and understand but again i would recommend using the edges option so generated clock latency already talked about is the sum of so this is the generated clock this is the network latency the latency here is the sum of the generated the source latency from master clock to generated clock and plus any source latency that your master clock can have right it's, so it's, it's, it's simple uh, this is an exercise i'll leave for you uh, there is a sys clock here assume any waveform here assume a 100 megahertz 50% duty cycle or anything and now tell me what tell you write down on paper do this uh, offline what is the what can be the create generated clock at div 2a and div 2b at these two point write the create so first write the create clock command for sys clock then write the create generated clock command for div 2a and div 2b right so uh, just please uh, be careful when you uh, please be careful about uh, with the polarities so what i try to include this in the lab i try to answer this in the lab but it is very easy you can do it yourself in now let's uh, talk about let's go deep into how prime time evaluates setup and hold edge now next three slides if you understand next three or four slides uh you will have no problem whatsoever in understanding understanding any kind of report timing for any clock relation right so whether you have multiple clocks or single clocks or you have very complex clock network any such case if you uh, the theory in next three or four slides would guide you in understanding any timing report any complex timing report right so uh many people in the industry are also not uh, very uh, comfortable with this but uh, i'll try to explain it right uh, in detail now uh, by default uh, assume you have a single clock this is very you we have repeated this many times so what are the setup edges uh, so clock at ff1 and clock at ff2 are same so we haven't uh, uh, so this is by default the edge at which data is launched on ff1 and the edge at which data is captured on ff2 are one clock period apart for second this is the default case why because you want any data launched by ff1 to be captured by ff2 after single cycle this is the default behavior and the same edge at ff2 now see clock are same so these two edges are same right this edge is one clock period apart but these two edges are same we just have copied the clock at ff1 and ff2 to show you clearly so this edge the same edge is used for hold why you want to make sure that any data launched by ff1 on a particular edge does not disturb meets the hold timing at ff2 right the same edge does not disturb the hold timing at ff2 this is why the default behavior setup is called a single cycle path cycle 1 hold is called a zero cycle path why setup is checked after one clock cycle hold is checked after zero clock cycle that means hold is checked at the same edge this is a very simple case now let's come to a case where you have multiple clocks and now we'll try to i try to explain the general theory on which SCA tool like prime time operate right for setup analysis prime time uh, let's uh, read the statement prime time looks at relationship between the active clock edges there is a keyword here active clock edges over a full repeating cycle when does a cycle repeat itself now this is the statement is common to a generic case of the launch and capture cycle uh, clocks being different equal to at least the lcm of the two clock periods for each capture edge at the destination flip flop tt assumes that the corresponding launch edge is the nearest source clock edge occurring before the capture 
we'll go to the figure and we'll keep uh, toggling between two slides of this statement and the figure and the diagram and we'll try to understand this. So the important thing here is that active clock edge it will analyze for the period for the LCM of the two clock periods. Let's see a figure here. So now let's say you have two clocks. Now I have separated out the clock one and clock two are different. Uh, the first clock is uh, 10, 0 and 5. So the second clock is 25, 5 and 25. So we have complicated stuff here now. There are two clocks. You do not have 50. The, the clock two does not have a rising at a zero, but rising at a five. So first, you you should understand. You should try and map the command with the clock waveform. It always helps to to draw waveform on paper. So create clock period 10. Rise at a, as a zero. This is the time scale. Rise at zero. Fall at five. Period is 10. Second is 25 period, but rise is at five. Fall is at 12.5. So this is now prime time. So, so we have marked the active edges. First keyword. First keyword active. First, what do you do? You mark the active edges. So this is where we have marked the active edges. Here and here. Second keyword, least common multiple of two clock period. What is the least common multiple? Period 10, period 25. The least common multiple is 50. So we'll draw the time scale till 50. Right. And we will analyze all the active edges. That's the idea. Third important point: for each capture edge at the destination flip flop, flop two is the one that is capturing data. There are two capture edges here: one and two, right? What is the setup check here? For each capture edge, we look for the launch edge, which is just before this capture edge. Just before, not at the same time. What we we treat uh, we see this capture as one. What is the launch edge just before this? This is the launch edge. We go to second uh, capture edge. Why we are analyzing this capture edge also because it lies within the LCM of the period. For this capture edge, the launch edge is this. So this is the setup check. In this case, there are two setup checks. Setup one. So launch will be at zero, capture will be at five. Setup so there's a five, in first case setup one there's a five and a difference zero and five. Second, the launch is at twenty, the capture is at thirty. The difference is ten. What is more restrictive? Five. You need to meet setup the combination logic plus the delay of the flip flop one plus the setup time of flip flop two. Everything should be less than five. The two cases should be less than five, should be less than ten. Prime time will check for five because it is more restrictive. Right? I'll repeat this again. Keywords active clock edge. So you first of all you map the command with the waveform, or you draw the waveform first, then write the command as a logical way. Mark the active edges. Second keyword LCM of the two clock periods. You draw this. You, got, you draw all the active edges within the LCM. LCM is 50 here, so that's why time scale is from 0 to 50. Third, you mark the capture edges at the capture clock. So we mark the capture edges at, at flip clock 2. Now we look for the launch edges that occur just before the capture edge, just before, not at the same time. So here, FF2 captures at 5. What is the launch edge just before 5? It's a 0. So one check is from 0 to 5. Other check is from 30 to 20. Take whatever is a restrictive one. Now, do we need to do this analysis ourselves? No, we do not need to do this, but we need to understand this is how prime time does it for So now let's say I have this design and I give it to a new guy who has who has not understood this case, but who has only studied this case, this type of simple case. Now we'll apply this same uh, concepts here, right? And see. Doesn't matter if the clock is same. So what is the LCM? LCM is just this one, zero to ten, because both on both sides the clock is same. We we mark out all the active edges. Now at so what is the capture edge? This and this. What is for capture edge one? What is the launch edge just before it? This one happens in the past, so there will be some edge here, not at the same time. 
for capsule S2, what is the launch edge just before it? This one. In this case, both are same. Both have difference of ten. That's why a setup is there. In this case, the setup is of single cycle, right? So you can apply the same concept to any any case now. Now, the idea of understanding this is this is how prime time operates, and many times when the when the clocks are complex, when there are multiple clocks, and they are uh, there are cap parts between among such clocks. It is very important to understand this to to make sure that you understand the timing report. So this is how timing report will look like. It will say clock one launch at five, launch at zero, clock two capture at five. Now you should understand where the edges zero and five come from, right? Sometimes there are negative numbers involved, so you need to understand where the negative number is coming from. If you understand this, you will uh, You can use this to write proper and accurate exception. We will talk about timing exceptions later. You can write, use it to write accurate timing exceptions later on, right? So it is very important to understand this. Now we have understood how prime time will calculate the setup edges. Now let's go to the holder. Holder is slightly more complex. Uh, have some patience. The hold again. We'll switch toggle between the two slides. First principle of hold: you should complete the setup analysis. You should understand what is the setup edges. What are the setup edges? Now let's go to hold. Hold relationships are based on the clock edges adjacent to the ones that are that determine the setup relationship. So first, broadly based form, do the exercise of setup to determine the more restrictive hold. What prime time will do? I'll not read out the text, but I'll I'll point out the the diagram. Now consider this. This setup edge one, right? We need to consider all setup edges, right? One and two here. There are two cases here. Now, in this case, prime time needs to make sure that whatever data is being launched here does not disturb. So, what it assumes is that this edge here, this particular edge here, is capturing the data launched by this one, right? The FF one. CLK at FF1 at zero, whatever it launches data at five, the data is captured. So it needs to make sure that whatever data is launched at zero does not disturb the hold edge at the active edge, which occurs before this setup edge. That means it needs to maintain the hold relationship for the capture edge that occurs before five. Setup is captured at five. The hold should be met one cycle behind. Always hold is one cycle behind setup. By default, setup is a single cycle path. Hold is a zero cycle path. Setup one, hold zero. Hold is one cycle behind setup. If this is setup between zero and five, the hold will be zero, and in this case, that edge will be somewhere in negative. Right? Fine. We note it down. Again, for the same edge, it will do the other way round. Now it will check whether the next the edge, which is after the launch edge, that is this edge now, does not disturb hold at five. So it will first it will take so the the formula is first determine the setup edges, then check hold for setup minus one. So the, this capture will remain same. You check for setup minus one to capture. Setup plus one. Sorry, you check from setup. Uh, I'll write this down later. So the first formula is launch minus one comma capture. This is what we have been learning. This is this is launch, and we check between launch. Uh, I'll clear it. I'll, I'll write it down again. Yeah. So first you mark the setup edges. Then between launch and capture minus one. This is the launch edge for setup. This is the capture edge for setup. We check the relationship between launch and capture minus one, which is somewhere in the negative. Second test we do is we do for launch minus one to capture. This is the case. Uh, or I will just just correct it. Sorry, launch plus one and capture. Uh, yeah. So second is we do launch 
plus one and capture. So, what is launch plus one? Launch plus one is this edge. What is the capture edge here? Same. So, hold one A is between launch minus one and cap. Uh, launch minus one and capture. Uh, sorry, launch and capture minus one. Hold one B is between launch plus one and capture. Similarly, we do it for two. Hold two A is between launch and capture minus one. Hold two B is between launch plus one and capture. Right. Among all these cases, prime time will only report which is most restrictive. What is most restrictive? Hold two B. Why? Because the edges are the same. Zero, zero, zero is most restrictive. Or uh, in some cases, what can happen if the launch edge is before the capture edge or hold? That can be more restrictive. But in this case, I guess hold to uh, hold to be would be most restrictive. So any time you look at uh, two clocks, you first determine what are the setup edges. Second, you determine what is the hold edges. Why do you need to do this? You need to do this to understand the report timing report. We, uh, when we design the clocks, uh, any 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 multiple clocks, any number of multiple clocks, prime time will do this for you automatically. But when you look at report timing, you should understand how prime time came up with you. Is it correct or not? Many times, by looking at the report timing, you will know that oh, my clock definitions are not correct. I need to correct them, right? So uh, this is this is how you first you understand it. And then you apply these concepts to understand the timing report, and then you can verify that whether your generated clock definitions are correct or not. Now, if this is an exercise. We'll try to do it in lab also. Consider a master clock. Consider these three generated clocks: generated clocks one, two, nine, five, six, thirty, one, two, five. And now tell any now calculate what are the setup point edges for the case where data is launched by clock A and captured by clock B, right? So. Uh, I would also recommend reading the uh, prime time uh, manual if you have uh, uh, access to it. It will explain this in much more in some more detail. But this is uh, the, the text on the slide also is good enough. I've, I've actually used the prime time manual itself to explain the concept. So you can remember this formula. Setup is easy. You first mark out the capture edge. Then look out for the launch edge which occurs just before the capture edge. Mark out the setup for the LCM part. For hold, you you have these two formulas: launch and capture minus one, launch plus one, and capture. Don't need, you don't need to mug it up. Once you start understanding these concepts, you can understand any any time before. Right? Now virtual clock. What is virtual clock? Virtual clock is something that does not have any fixed port in the design. It is kind of a floating clock, and it is used mostly used. To define input and output delay for interface. This is one example where there there are two virtual clocks defined: uh, virtual clock SAD and virtual clock CRD. Some period we create a a, a regular clock uh, period 10, and we can use this these virtual clocks to define uh, input delays uh, or output delays on on some ports, right? So this is this slide just captures that. We already studied that. Okay, now we are we are uh, Let's look at exception. What are exception for concept? Before this, uh, let's say if you don't know don't know about exception, don't apply an exception. This is what prime time will do by default. Whatever we have understood till now, prime time will will break your whole design into timing parts. It will assign various path groups based on the capture clock to all those timing parts. If you have multiple clocks, it will use this logic to arrive at the launch and capture edges for setup and hold, right? And if you have multiple clocks, it will assume that if you don't give any exception, it will assume that all clocks, uh, uh, whether they are uh, whether they, whether their period have LCM limited LCM or not, it will try and it will assume that all clocks have path among them. Now let's look at this this case and see uh, and uh, work out a case where uh, a clock, first clock, there are two clocks. First clock has a period 20, and second clock has a period of 31. Now you say, man, the LCM is pretty big, man. Both are odd number, uh, both are prime numbers. 7 into 31, that the LCM is pretty big. 
and you and uh, so for such cases if you look carefully to think carefully such cases are not logically possible in the sense that if there are two clocks whose periods are not uh, integer multiples or some uh, some rational number multiples of each other with limited lcm then that design is not you cannot have two clocks with period 17 and 31 and have paths between them in all probability when whenever there are two such clocks with the period not multiple or multiple of each other then in all probability all the paths between such clocks are should be common right they are asynchronous clocks so you have so many times i'll tell you a case now let's say you have a uh, you have a chip that is for mobile phones and it has a cpu which works let's say at 1 gigahertz and it has a a video core let's say that works at 330 megahertz for example now uh, the cpu part will work independently of the video core right so you have two clocks one is a cpu clock other is a video core clock now uh, they don't have a relationship with each other cpu clock is work is working in the cpu domain and video clock is working in the video domain but what may happen is that the video domain might based on some condition it might raise some interrupt to the cpu domain so what will happen now in this case the video clock will launch the interrupt and the cpu clock will capture the interrupt but it is not expected that such a path will meet the regular and set up set up whole time constraint why it is not accept, expected it is not expected because the clocks are not multiple of each other and proper multiples of each other and we haven't designed it like that and it is not necessary to design it like that interrupts are mostly one time occurring signal they don't uh, toggle every time every clock cycle so you can uh, you can choose to not check any setup or hold time on that there's a completely separate design concept which you might it might become clear in some other course based on uh, on digital design but these cases are normal so in this case uh, if you don't give anything if you do not define in timing exception prime time will assume that it will do all such sorts of uh, calculation it will uh, launch data at video core clock and it will try to capture in cpu clock and it will use all such principles to define the second hold edges now do you really want that no so for cases where you do not want prime time to go on with its regular timing calculation techniques you can give certain commands to override those and to make your timing analysis more accurate such group of commands is called timing exception these are the list of commands that come under the category of timing exception set case analysis set disable timing set false path multi cycle path Set my set is set in the list. We look at each of them in some detail. So just remember, what is the timing exception? Timing exception is any command that will force prime time to override its default behavior. Right? Case analysis. Case analysis is a way of specifying a given mode for the design without altering the metric function. You can specify for current time. So you, what you can say is a typical, uh, the most famous example. your chip your design has two modes functional and scan it's, it's a very uh, common thing the scan path will sensitize the path which are between the scan input and the data pin of the clock without it will bypass the combination of the scan shift path right now if you do not do anything uh, in a particular session uh, you will see both the function and the uh, scan path the scan shift path and you do not want to do that you want two separate cases So in such case, what you can do is there will be a pin called scan enable, uh, or test enable, or test mode, something like that. You can set a case analysis of zero. When you set set a case analysis of zero on such a pin, the design will enter functional mode. So prime time will calculate these type of calculate delays, assuming that scan enable is zero or scan test mode is zero, and that means it will only worry about the functional mode. so any such case uh, a scan test mode like signal typically it would uh, mean that if we set zero on this it will switch off all the uh, the paths uh, which are from scan enable to the next data pin of the clock so uh, 
but the netlist remains same you do not need to uh, you do not need to make any modification in the netlist you can just use set case analysis to tell prime time that okay i want you to analyze timing assuming that this signal is zero or this particular signal is one or this particular signal can only vary or this particular signal can only form these are two examples here. right you can say that set case has zero and i in one you can say that uh, the uh, you can set a rising case analysis on these pins these two pins which means that there will not be any fallage here there is one example at the end of the session which will make uh, it clear when to use a case analysis but this is a very powerful tool command and it is it is a very popular command and most of the times uh, the most practical functionality the most popular functionality is to assign different modes for sto you can have one mode for functional one mode for scan one for some other test mode and use in set case analysis appropriate case analysis on the controlling pins right? second is false path so i was discussing a case where there is a video core and there is a cpu and there is an interrupt signal and you don't want time time to check the setup hold between these two domains so what you could do is you can tell prime time set false path and you can set the false path on this interrupt signal what it will tell prime time it will tell prime time do not check any timing constraint on this signal so it will not check any setup or any hold on this particular signal which is what we want so by definition false path is a logic path that is this but should not be analyzed whatever case we were talking about so idea keyword it exists the path exists but should not be analyzed for time so uh, for example a path can exist between two multi text logic blocks that are never selected at the same time so if two blocks and only one is selected at one time so any path between these two blocks is not valid this is one example where we are uh setting a false path from a register to some register we should be careful about what we use them from what we use them to remember for a register to register path start point is always the clock pin and capture is always the data pin so you should be careful in from path there always should be a clock if you are talking if you are mentioning a, a path start point so in from you should always mention the clock pin of the register in capture if it's a clock you want to decide uh, you want to set the false path on so minus 2 you should always mention the data pin not the not the other way around so if you set uh, so it should always be very specific you should always be very specific to avoid any errors right this is very dangerous both all timing exceptions are very dangerous if you give a wrong command and it is accepted then it is the most dangerous situation a typical chip can have hundreds of false paths and it is a difficult task to uh, debug that if you have given any wrong command and which is accepted for so for example if you by mistake do a ffv3 and it's a valid flop so it's a wrong timing exception timing will not be checked and uh, in my experience any timing that is by mistake not checked will most probably violate on chip and you will have lot of problems in debugging once it is So timing except uh, so so any timing failure debugging on silicon it is very very difficult right so please be careful when you apply false path right uh, false path is mostly used to uh, define clock relationships so in uh, so one example I told you that we can set a false path on the interrupt system from video core to that goes from video core to the CPU now let's say Uh, apart from interrupt, there are ten more signals that track, that uh, go from video core to. Now let's say ten interrupts that go from video core to uh, CPU. Now in this case, you have to write ten false paths, right, to declare false path on each of these interrupts, each of these paths. Second better way, second more sophisticated and better way is to tell that all the paths from video core clock to CPU clock are false. So this is how we define the clock relationship. Ideally, let's say your your design has ten clocks. If you do not do anything, prime time will assume that all paths between any two clocks are valid, so it will produce timing reports for the same. You can tell that for any two asynchronous clocks, you can tell like this. You can say set false path from clock one to clock two, and it is also essential to do the other way around from clock two to clock one. Paths from video to CPU are false paths. But there might also be paths which are from CPU to the video, and we also want want them to be false paths. So you need to give 
two for this part from clock one to clock two from clock two to clock one. There is also one more way of doing this in two data. So false paths are most popular to define clock relationships. Third is disable timing. Again, it's a it's a less popular way of doing things because uh, people will use false path. Uh, so in a particular situation. Uh, in fact, you can apply any of any of the three. You can apply the pivot timing, or you can apply phase analysis, or you can apply a false time. But you should know what to apply when. Some commands work better for some cases. Uh, for example, for defining clock relationship, that false path works best, right? For uh, putting the chip into a particular mode like scan or function or, or some other text mode, case analysis works best. Disable timing. What it does is that it will disable, it will remove the timing off. Let's say I say that disable timing from pin A to pin Z of a particular ambient. It will not even consider that path. False path is something different. False path, the path exists. Prime time will do the delay calculation. The only thing it won't do is it won't check the setup and hold function. Disable timing, it removes the affected objects from the delay calculation itself. So when 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 should you should you use this if all the paths you should use disable timing only if all the paths through a particular pin are false remember pin it is pin based false path can be between two clocks but you cannot disable timing there you cannot use disable timing to define the clock relationship you can only do disable timing only if all the paths through a particular pin are false you probably might see some of the. I might use disable timing in one of the labs. I'm not sure about it as the case now. I'll again we'll see one example. Uh, lastly, it's Maxwell. Uh, so fourth is Maxwell and Mendeley. By default, prime time uh, will use the clock relationship we have talked about to consider the setup and hold capital. If you want to override it, you can use Maxwell or Mendeley command. Again, these are quite dangerous. Uh, you should be very careful before using them. Now let's say uh, there's a, a regular edge a to edge b path, and uh, by default prime time will use the uh, normal setup and hold capture edges to, to uh, check the timing constraint. But let's say you have some notion that these this the path from edge a to edge b should not take more than some time. So you can apply such time of timing that might be like well from edge a to edge b. With this. If you apply this, ideally, uh, in this case, in this example, uh, okay, ideally, in this case, we should say get pins reg C P to get pins reg B D. This is the accurate case, more accurate command. With this timing exception, P T will ignore the clock relationship, and it will, by default, it will check whether uh, the delay between these two registers, that is, the uh, that exceeds uh, the delay between these, the total part delay. Minus the setup requirement of the endpoint does not exceed 12 timing minutes. It will not use the clock edges to show you the timing report. It will uh, the timing report will look a bit different. You can also use the Mendeley command. Set Maxley and set Mendeley are the most famous exam. The most famous uh, usage is when you want to constrain a wholly combination path on input clock. You can use set Maxley or you can use virtual clock. We have uh, seen this example in Unity. The same case here. Last timing exception is the multi-cycle path. We've already discussed that multi-cycle path is used to constrain a timing path, which it is expected will not capture in single cycle. So let's say you have from FF4 to FF5, the logic is slow. You know that. So by default, setup capture is single cycle, hold capture is zero cycle, and you know that uh, path between FF4 and FF5 is not going to meet a single cycle. So you can Tell prime time accordingly. How do you do that? Like this. You tell prime time that set multi cycle path minus setup 2 from FF4 to FF5. What it means, the default value for setup as I talked before is 1. You are making it 2. Default, what it would the case would be that this launch edge, the capture would happen here, but now you are telling prime time to shift the capture edge by 1. Minus 2 means default is 1. Two means you shift the capture edge by one. So now the uh, the capture becomes two clock period. If you give setup five, 
it will the default is this one it will jump by 4 right. So, uh, this formula set up set multi cycle path minus set up n means that you first check what is default and then you jump by n minus 1. So, in other words you can also say that the number here tells how many clock periods the path will take. So, here it will take 2 clock periods instead of 1. Now, the principle is we have also seen earlier in the earlier slide that hold edges are determined by setup edges. Now, in this case what we did we shift the setup edge right. Earlier the capture edge was this the call capture edge was this we have shifted it correspondingly hold will also shift if you give just this simple this command what time time will do earlier it was checking hold between this and this now it will shift the hold edge as well hold is always set up minus 1 right by default. So, now the hold will get checked between this edge and this edge which is not what we want the hold relationship should remain intact why because if you see there is nothing happening to hold we still want to make sure that whatever gets launched on a particular clock period at SF4 should meet on the same edge it should meet hold at SF5 hold we will still the setup setup becomes 2 hold becomes 1 we do not want that we want the hold to be pulled back to 0 how do we do that like this actually for any multi cycle setup path we should give a hold path as well. So, by default ok after applying this command setup becomes this hold becomes this. So, we have applied this command in addition we also apply this. So, almost always the case will be set multi cycle path minus setup n along with this you also tell set multi cycle path minus hold and minus 1. This 1 means you pull back by 1 default was this uh, as soon as you gave the first command prime time shifted the hold edge to 1 by giving set multi cycle path minus hold 1 you are pulling it back you are pulling it back right. So, again remember for setup if you give number n for hold you give n minus 1 right. So, this is multi cycle path. Now, let us do an exercise uh, in this exercise uh, there is one case where you can use multiple you can use more than one type of command what is most suitable let us see. Now, let us say there is a adder and there is there are muxes a, a and b c and d. So, select pin S selects between A and B, same select pin selects between C and D, uh, same select pin uh, selects between uh, uh, it, it depends whether the output goes to E or F. Let us see assume that there are clocks here at each of A, B, C and D there are clocks and again E is captured and F is captured as a, as a clock. Now, let us consider case when S is 0, when S is 0 A will go ahead a will go ahead, C will go ahead, S being 0, F is 0 and A plus C will go to B. When S so, uh, I will uh, write it so yeah. So, the path the valid path is from A to E, A to C, C to E, A to E and C to E. Other case B to F d to f. So, if you do not do anything if I am not doing anything if I am not applying any timing if I am not applying any uh, exception what p t does it will report all you can actually it is very easy to make this write it into a log you can you should write this into a log and uh, you do not need to actually include the clock as well you can simply write the combination clock and uh, define virtual clocks uh, at a b c and d in fact let me do this in the in one of the last I will do this in one of the last I will make that kind of perfect. So, uh, uh, by default prime time will report from a to a to f also because it does not it considers s to be it is a static timing analysis it will not assume any value in it. Now, how do I switch off the path from a to f for example, because a to f is not a true form first case I can use a case analysis I can say set as set case analysis 0 on s. As soon as I do this 
the only paths reported will be from a to e and c to e but all other paths will be switched off b to f and d to f are also switched off now i also want to check path from b to f and d to f what do i do now i set the phase analysis to f is equal to 1 this is one method of doing it as a good method of doing it so you first if you do not want unwanted paths you could first check uh, for s is equal to 0 secondly you should check s is equal to 1 it's a good method but it's not the best method why because any time you change the case analysis it will force prime time to calculate delay again because any case analysis needs to be propagated to comp for example setting case analysis here prime time needs to know understand the functionality of this mux this and gate it will start doing delay calculation again and for a full chip the delay calculation uh, there is a command for update timing where we tell prime time okay now you can calculate the delay there is a separate command update timing when we say update timing prime time will recalculate the delays uh, if any of the constraint has been changed any such constraint right a case analysis means that the delay needs to be calculated again for a full chip for a huge design this is a very time consuming effort i mean it can take up to 2 3 4 5 6 hours even 10 hours even 12 hours even a whole day for a big design you do not want that so you should choose exceptions carefully other case what i can do uh, i can use a false path i can say set false path path from a to f from c to f from b to e from d to e now this is a much more intelligent timing exception why because now uh, after applying the false path in the same session right i am able to see timing from a to e c to e b to f and d to f i am able to see all the valid timing paths this is better than case analysis right so in this case we saw that you can apply uh, a case analysis you can apply false path you can even apply a disable timing let's not go into that uh, again the worst method of doing it so in such in this case there are two good methods false false path and case analysis and of course case analysis uh, is inferior to false path because you need to change the value and that will trigger the update timing and you need to do the delay calculation only there is still one more better way of using virtual clocks i will explore that in the lab okay right? how to use the virtual clock that is the best way of doing it. so again a note that if you have if you apply false path it will be from you need to have one false path from a to f second from c to f third from b to e fourth from d to e you need four false path constraints right so uh, we'll see in the lab how a virtual clock can be very useful here, right in this case so this is where sta becomes a, a, such an interesting thing that you have so many commands at your disposal and you should use timing exception you should use intelligent use of virtual clock to do the sta that is less compute intensive and it covers all the all the modes it covers like functional mode test mode and it is very effective right so uh, two engineers can do sta in very two different ways right one will be one and one of them will be more sophisticated than the other right so that that's where sta becomes a a good uh, uh, engineering challenge right uh, let's move on. let's uh, look at the last slide for this session which is about clock relationships now we have, we see we saw that uh, if you have multiple clocks you should accurately define uh, clock relationship uh, using false path for example you can uh, tell time time what uh, the, how the clocks are uh, related to each other are they asynchronous or they are if you uh, if they are synchronous you don't need to do anything you just need to define the clock if two of the clocks are asynchronous you should set false path between them now uh, better than uh, there's one more command which is slightly better which is better than false path uh, in some aspects uh, in when we are not talking about noise issues or cross stuff issues all so this command is called set clock group and uh, so set clock group and set false path are exactly same when you ignore signal integrity issues uh, we'll talk about signal integrity later in one of the session but just uh, remember it for now that false path and clock group are much more or less same when it comes to 
when you ignore signal integrity, when you are not worried about signal integrity in noise, but when you are worried about signal integrity at noise, do not use false path to define clock relationships, use set clock rules. This is what prime time recommends and we will we'll see why. So, let us first look at set, set clock groups and then later when we talk about signal integrity, we will see why should we use the set clock groups command, why is it more powerful. So, first case, uh, there is the first case uh, where you have two clocks and please remember if you have clocks like this clock 2 and clock 1, where clock 2 is generated from clock, uh, clock 2 is generated from clock 1. More or less, most probably they are synchronous to each other. If you are generating a clock from a divider, more in all probability, clock two and clock one should be synchronous to each other, unless and until you designed it to be explicitly right. So uh, please be careful if you want to set false path between a generated clock and its master. Usually, it's very dangerous. So in this case, we will not have any false path, no clock group command. Simple case. Second case where clock 1 and clock 2 are asynchronous to each other, they are any two clocks that are coming from different PLLs or different oscillators should be false path always. If you have different PLLs, even if the frequency is same, these clocks should not be synchronous because each PLL is different to each other, right? Each PLL will have its own lock period, each PLL will have its own jitter spec. You cannot have Two clocks synchronous that are coming from different PLLs does not matter what the frequency is, right. So, in this case, one is coming from oscillator, one is coming from some other source, obviously, they are asynchronous. You can use set false path, obviously, but when you use set clock groups, you can say set clock groups minus asynchronous clock 1 and clock 2. So, there the group command tells that CK1 is a different group, CK2 is a different group. So, you can you are telling that the group to which CK1 belongs and the group to which CK2 belongs are asynchronous to each other, right. Third case where you have CLK1 and so this is a case where there is a mux at one time only one clock can be active. So, in this case you can tell again you can have false path here clock, clock 1 to clock 2 false path clock 2 to clock 1 false path or you can have case analysis here, but in this case set clock groups is more powerful. You tell it that these two groups are logically exclusive. That means that in one analysis at one point of time only one clock is active biologically exclusive. So, asynchronous means both the clocks are active in the design, but the paths between those are false. Logically exclusive means that only one will be active at one point of time. Now, from a timing analysis point of view, this command asynchronous you could also use asynchronous here. In this case for, for the third case here where there is a mask, you can even, even use asynchronous or you can use false path, but logically exclusive is useful when you have signal integrity when you are including signal integrity in your analysis, you are including noise analysis, we will see again why. Why is it important to make sure that you are using the correct switch whether it be logically exclusive or asynchronous when it comes to signal integrity. Without signal integrity, there is no difference between second case and third case. In second case, also the clocks are asynchronous, in third case, also. So, in both the second and the third case, their prime time will not check for any path that is launched from clock 1 and captured at clock 1 or the other way around, other vice versa, right. So, this was the last slide. Uh, uh, it was a bit more technical this session. Uh, we learned a lot more about clock. So, uh, my promise is that if you understand this lecture perfectly, you will be, be a good SC engineer. This session contains one of the most important concepts of SC and that is the clocks and the clock relationships plus timing exceptions. Timing exceptions, so uh, now after understanding this you can define any complex clock, any complex related clock, you can define the clock relationships now easily and plus you can use the powerful timing exception to make your make your timing analysis much more accurate. Now, see exceptions are very very useful, they are dangerous, but they are very very useful. In a particular chip there are millions of timing paths and without timing exceptions with so many clocks in place, you will have thousands and thousands of paths that are either false or they do not matter and, and, and so on, right. So, 
for example, if you if you have like ten clocks and you forgot to specify the clock relationship, you'll have so many paths between so all the pairs of clocks that might not be even true, right? So that that's where uh, the timing exceptions are useful. They are a necessary evil. Why I say evil because any false timing exception may cause uh, a flippant failure. That's why I call them evil. So they are evil, uh, necessary evil. You should use them uh, very carefully, and you should review them again and again before sign off if you're working in in the, in the industry. And uh, you can use them to make your timing analysis much more accurate and much more sophisticated, right? In the next session, we will talk about uh, again the second most powerful concept of SPA, which is the on-chip variation. Right? Thank you.